Hello, I'm Chris Richardson, an electronics engineer and I focus on power supplies. This is the fourth in a series of web seminars for people who like power supplies but aren't necessarily trained to be electronics engineers. So far in this series we've gathered some low-cost equipment to test power supplies, looked at unregulated power supplies, tested various linear regulators, and now it's time to test some switching regulators, the modern power supplies that dominate the market today. The buck is the simplest switching regulator and I think it's the easiest to understand. The controlled switch on top, a bipolar transistor or more commonly MOSFET, works together with the diode D1 to make a rectangular wave at the point where the switch, diode and inductor connect. This is the switching node and it's the most important voltage to probe in the system. The inductor and the output capacitor form a low pass filter whose output is then mostly DC with some AC ripple. The average value of that output voltage depends upon the input voltage and upon the duty cycle of the rectangular wave. Duty cycle is equal to T on divided by the sum of T on and T off. And the higher the duty cycle, the higher the output voltage. This switcher bucks down the output voltage, hence its name. And, much like a linear regulator, the theoretical maximum V out is equal to V in. In practice, the maximum V out we can achieve is somewhat less than V in. The first switching regulator we're going to test today is a buck regulator. You can see the circuit here. This is the input capacitor. These are some small input capacitors. These are the two controlled switches. Now this is a synchronous regulator, meaning that instead of a diode for the low side, it has a MOSFET. Here's the power inductor. This loop of wire here in series is so that we could put a current probe if we had one. And these are the output capacitors here. Right now, this buck converter is unloaded. I'm using 5 volts from the ATX power supply. Here's the approximately 5 volts in. The output I've adjusted to 1.9 volts, approximately. Right now, there's no load. These are the four power resistors here of 8 ohms each, so in parallel they give a load of 2 ohms. So when I connect them, they'll give a load of about 1 amp. We can see the input voltage drops slightly and the output voltage also drops slightly, but it's still regulated. I switch things around to show the high efficiency of switching inverters here. So now I'm measuring input voltage here and input current here. So I want you to see that when we power the circuit with this load connected at 5 volts it draws about 380 milliamps. Now I'm using the 12 volt input to power it so we can see just under 12 volts here the load is the same, the output voltage is the same but now the output current has dropped to 20 milliamps. This is an interesting property of switching converters as the input voltage goes up the input current goes down and in fact when you're testing a switching regulator one of the first basic tests is if you have a variable input supply to watch and make sure that as you increase the input voltage the input current goes down. This is the back side of the buck regulator circuit. I'm measuring the switching node and the output voltage with two oscilloscope probes. There's the 1 amp load. It's being powered by the 12 volt input. And here we can see the switching node in yellow with its duty cycle and the resulting ripple on the output voltage about 20 to 30 millivolts peak to peak. The same experiment again, except that this time we're powering it by 5 volts at the input. And now we can see that the duty cycle is much higher. Remember in a buck converter, the duty cycle is approximately equal to the output voltage, 1.9 volts, divided by the input voltage, 5 volts. And we have also a slightly lower ripple, maybe somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 millivolts. A boost regulator is little more than a buck regulator operating in reverse. Just imagine that D1 was a MOSFET and TR1 a diode. Where you see V in, there is always a capacitor, even though it's not shown in this schematic. A boost regulator is a great circuit for explaining why the inductor is the heart of most switching regulators. To make an output voltage that is higher than the input voltage, the boost stores energy in the inductor's magnetic field, which develops as the current in L1 increases while TR1 is on. The control circuit turns TR1 off while the current is still flowing. The inductor can increase the voltage across it to infinity, in theory, in order to maintain that current flow. Fortunately, it doesn't have to go to infinity, it just needs to increase enough to put D1 into forward bias. Then the current can flow to the output. In theory, the boost regulator itself can increase the output voltage to infinity, but in practice it's limited to about 10 times the input voltage. One last but important note here. The boost regulator can only increase V out with respect to V in. It's like the exact opposite of the buck. For my example boost regulator, I'm using a PCB here that actually has two switching regulators. The top part here is an inverting regulator. It's a very interesting topology, but I won't have time to talk about it. It's disabled. The bottom part is the boost, 
and the parts are quite small. The input capacitor is actually hidden underneath the input leads. Here's the power inductor. The output diode is hidden behind this test fixture. This is what I use to make very precise measurements of the switching node. And the output capacitor is also a bit hidden, but it's underneath this test fixture. And that's also to make very precise measurements for the output voltage. Right now I've got 5 volts in. It's coming from my ATX power supply and about 14.7 volts out. You might be wondering why I would have 14.7 volts. And the honest answer is this circuit, like most of the ones I've shown, are left over from things that I did specially for different kinds of customers. So 14.7 is not a typical voltage, but these are adjustable regulators and you can get pretty much anything you want out of them. Here's the boost converter again. This time I'm measuring input current and output current. So when I switch it on, which is 5 volts, see that it's drawing about 900 milliamps here at the output and 3.5 amps at the input. Remember, that's the opposite of the buck converter. In the buck converter, since the output voltage is lower, the input current is always lower than the output current. And in the boost converter, it's the reverse. Fish power efficiency is high, so input power is approximately equal to output power. So since input voltage is lower than output voltage, input current is higher than output current. For the last boost converter test, I have the circuit here. It's power with the same load, about 900 milliamps, so 5 volts in to 14 volts, 14.7 volts out. And here we can see the switching node in yellow and the output voltage AC coupled in blue. So two important things to notice as differences between this and the buck converter. The switch node voltage goes between zero and the output voltage and the ripple is much higher. And that's always true in a boost converter. In a boost converter, the input current, the input voltage is smoother and the output voltage has more ripple and the opposite is true in a buck. The final topology of the three basics is the buck boost. As the name implies, it can generate an input voltage whose absolute value is either higher or lower than that of the input voltage. But, and this is a big but, the polarity of that output voltage is reversed with respect to the input. The number of modern circuits that need negative voltages is shrinking, but sensitive amplifiers, sensors, and other equipment still use positive and negative voltages to operate. Like the boost, the buck boost uses the amazing ability of the inductor to make that negative voltage. In this case, the voltage across the inductor reverses polarity in order to maintain current flow when TR1 turns off. If you inspect the transfer function on the left, in theory the output voltage can go to negative infinity. In practice, it can get to about minus 10 times the input voltage. Well, I'm very sorry to say that I could not find any evaluation board or demo PCB to show off an actual inverting buck boost regulator. But you can usually take almost any buck regulator and turn it into an inverting buck boost by changing the polarity and the connection of the output diode and the output inductor. So perhaps I'll be able to do something like this in a future video. No discussion of switching regulators would be complete without the flyback. In terms of sheer volume, the most common switcher in existence is the buck. Just your mobile phone has 5 to 10 of them. But the flyback is number 2. Just about every AC to DC power supply under 50 watts uses this very flexible topology in one form or another. Now, the flyback is based upon the buck boost, but it has two windings in its inductor. In fact, if you made NPS, which is the ratio of the two windings, equal to 1, the flyback and the buck boost would have exactly the same transfer function. The ratio of those windings allows VL to be equal to VN, but it could also be much, much higher or much, much lower. The two windings can also be isolated, and this is great for both electrical safety, as in not electrocuting anyone, and also for isolating sensitive circuits from noisy ones. Finally, the flyback output, since it's disconnected by the transformer or coupled inductor, can be positive or negative. With all the wires disconnected, I can show you the most important parts of the supply. So we have the input capacitors here, a discrete power N MOSFET here on the primary side. This is the transformer, or better known as a coupled inductor, the output diode and the output capacitors. Notice also there's this separation between the primary side and the secondary side so this can be an isolated converter. And again, that's for either electrical safety or to get rid of noise. If we look on the back, you can see, again, the separation here. Now, these diodes are actually shorting the ground of the primary to the ground of the secondary. So this particular circuit is not isolated, but it could be. If we wanted to isolate it, we would get rid of these resistors and would use a device called an optocoupler to do the feedback. That's the control of the power supply. Here I have a small flyback power supply 
but it was designed to operate from 36 volts up to 72 volts. That's typically known as a telecom range. It's at the very, very limit of what I can do with my ATX power supply. So to get these 22.4 volts, should be 24 volts, I'm actually running from the negative 12 volts up to the positive 12 volts. And I can do that because the ATX power supply uses the same common ground for both of those two. But there's a problem. If I were to try to measure with an oscilloscope probe here, since this is Earth here, as soon as I connect and make a touch here, my supply turns off because I've caused a short circuit from an output voltage to Earth. So what I'm going to do is cheat a little bit and actually use a so-called isolated lab power supply to do the rest of the experiments. Here's the flyback regulator again. Now it's being powered by 48 volts at the input, and that's coming from this triple lab power supply. Now, on eBay I checked, and these typically cost anywhere from about 100 euros to 200 euros. So they're not free, but they're not, let's say, budget busting. In any case, a flyback regulator actually has two switching nodes. Right? It really consists of two inductors that are coupled in the same core. So we're looking at the primary side connected to the power MOSFET in yellow, and the secondary side connected to the diode in blue. Also notice that these voltages are much higher than the ones that we've been dealing with so far. So you see me in these videos touching the circuits while they're operating, and that's fine maybe for up to 12 volts or so, but I definitely would not touch this circuit while it was operating. 48 volts is enough to give you a nasty shock. That concludes part four of power supplies for non double -E's. Stay tuned for part five, where we'll review, compare, and contrast the different types of power supplies which we've seen so far to see which ones work best in which situations. On behalf of myself and electronicstutorials.ws, thanks for watching.